I am Vinny Tonerich. Folks, the good intentions have been stolen. Don't worry. I'm here to help you get them back. You may be soft and succulent at the beginning of this process, but hang in there before long. You'll be lean and mean. Yeah, that's an old theme song from my from my early days, back in the early 70s, Hawaii Five O, but is there for a reason. We're going to be talking to a guy today who calls himself Keto Five O. I'm talking about none other than Mr. Eric Reynolds. How you doing, Eric? Hey, Vinny. How you doing? Thanks for having me, man. Pretty good, brother. Um, Eric, you, you know, Friday's show, I always like to bring in, you know, we call them luminaries, experts, people, people in the field that that know way more than me, uh, doctors and what have you. Um, and you're not that guy. You're you're not um, you're not a doctor. You're not a PhD. You might have a P do you have a PhD? Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> um, but uh, you were a cop, and you came to my attention because I started seeing your stuff on on uh, probably Twitter maybe two years ago, something like that. And you know when you see Keto Five O, it's like all right, who is this jackass and what is he doing? And next thing you know. Is, oh, wait, he's got a van. What, what's this van all about? You know, you never really get everything when you look, you know, you just see things online. It's like, he's going, what's he selling? He's going around in a van? You know, I think I've seen his kids. What, he's got his kids with him. What, what is this guy doing? But you have a pretty interesting story. And I love bringing, I used to have a whole Saturday show for success stories, but we were doing so many shows that whenever I see a really cool success story, I bring them into the Friday show. Um, you you just started down this road. Well, let, let's start at the beginning. Okay. Keto, Keto 5 -0. You were a cop. Yes. Right? Tell me about that. Where were you? Where were you in the world? Where were you copping? All right. So I was a police officer in Boynton Beach, Florida. That's down near the West Palm Beach area, Boca Raton, you know, Delray. And, you know, I was a cop for almost 20 years there. Started in 2001 and I retired in 2019. So almost 20 years, it was a little bit of months overlap that I was a little short, but it didn't affect my pension at all to walk away on my 50th birthday. So that was a pretty cool day, you know. I just spilled espresso all over my face. I see that. Yeah, it, it, Can you see it? Is it any? No, you're good. You're <laughs> good, man. You see it? Okay, yeah, it's on my T-shirt, but who cares? Yeah, an Italian without a stain on a T-shirt. When does that ever happen? So you got the pension, you got out. You don't have any bullet holes. You ever got shot at? The whole time you were down there? Yeah, I was shot actually by a bank robber in 2012. Oh, wow. Um, he robbed Del a Delray Bank and we got in a car chase and uh, he crashed. And instead of running, he opened his door and started shooting at me and the other officer. And we put about 36 rounds into the car, 14 into him. But he put one through my foot and one through my, like, grazed my leg. And, you know, that ended up having to have treatment and surgery on and stuff like that. So I didn't, I wasn't unscathed in that uh, altercation, you know? Yeah. You know, we go through this thing now where, you know, every, you know, and I don't get into politics on this show. I, I don't believe in, in dealing with politics. Everyone else can have that. But when people start defunding the police and now, you know, I read things where they go, no one wants to be a cop anymore. You know, when I was a kid, that was like a highly, that was up there with firemen. Right. Yeah. You know, the, the highly respected jobs. Now you, you read all these reports, cities can't get anyone decent to show up for the job. Right. Yeah. It, it, are you seeing that down in Florida where you were? Is that why you got out at 20 years and didn't go from for longer? Well, you know, after being shot, you know, I did develop not only becoming, you know, metabolically obese and sick. But PTSD started to wreak havoc with me. And I didn't know it. A lot of the hidden symptoms and stuff were there. But but what I'm seeing with the cops down there is it's the smart cops are not telling their kids to join departments anymore because of there's other ways you can go to make money and be have a healthier career. You know, now you're being judged for everything you do. And sometimes you got to adapt to the environment you're, you're in, you know, and sometimes you're not a robot, you know, and we've seen it, you know, some guys just don't mesh well in certain parts of the city, you know, and certain guys do, you know, and they started getting micromanaging. I think it's going to go the route of like the fire departments where they're just going to have us at the station house or the PD and then have us go to calls and come back. No more active patrols, no more traffic. It's all going to be big brother. And then 
what's your interaction going to be with a cop at that point? You know, so it's going to be changing. You know, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. You know, when I think way back when cops used to have beats and people don't even know what that means anymore. So people in the community actually knew the cop first name basis. You know, I grew up in a small town. There was more Barney Fife ish down yeah. there where everybody knew Ange and Barney, you know, there was just yeah. a few cops and, uh, now I was talking to my nephew and he was telling me, you know, because my, my brother owns a tow truck service and, you know, a lot of times cars are, they pick up cars when people are, you know, drunk or whatever. And then these people come to get their car. Cops get, they're involved with cops all the time type of thing. Yeah. And my nephew's like, yeah, half of these cops, they, they don't know what to do. <clears throat> like they don't know what their job is because they don't want to get sued. They don't want to end up in court. So the cop shows up and does kind of the standoffish approach. And there's crazy people yelling at you, you know, it's like, so it, it really makes me wonder where we're heading and what direction we're heading. And when guys like you decide not to go 25 or 30 years, which is what cops used to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now they're dying like the first five years when they freaking retire because of all the metabolic disease and, you know, obviously the stress and, you know, they, a lot of cops don't take care of themselves at the end, man. It's not always their fault. Obviously, poor food, you know, diet is a big factor, but stress is killing them. Cortisol levels are jacked up. You know, you're hypervigilance all the time. And it's not a really safe, conducive environment long term. My mom did 30 years as a homicide sergeant in Miami, Florida. And my stepfather did 30 years. So I already had that under my belt as a kid growing up in that environment. So by the time I hit that 19, 20 years, I had two young kids. I could see the writing on the wall. It was, you know, not to say that body cameras and all that aren't effective, but when you have supervisors reviewing a cop's whole day just to pick out a needle, you know, pick out every little detail, even conversations you have with family, it just gets a little bit too intrusive into the job. And now you're not even concentrating on the job. You're more concentrating on inner politics. And that's why I got out. And we will get to your mom before the end of the show. Um, just so everyone will know, his mom, <clears throat> there's a, uh, I want to say Netflix, or maybe it's on Amazon. I can't remember. Uh, it's Netflix. It's Netflix. Netflix is a multi-series thing on, on this uh, drug kingpin, uh, Griselda. And your mom was involved in that. We'll get into that after we talk about yeah. you. And um, I, I, because I'm interested in that and, and what happened there. I've never, I, I haven't seen a series because I can't stand to watch crime shows. You know, my thing is people laugh at me because Christmas season comes around. I watch Hallmark movies and my my in-laws say, oh, my God, you really watch these Hallmark? It's just, yeah. I get yelled at all day online. You know, people tell me that I'm horrible and, you know, I'm an animal killer. But, you know, I don't yeah. in the environment. <laughs> all things that are not true about me, right? Right. I'm a killer. When did I kill an animal? Oh, you eat meat. You eat dead carcasses. You're an animal killer. And you don't believe in, in, you know, in global warming because you're telling people to eat cow. Okay, just because I'm doing one thing doesn't mean another thing. A plus B is not C in the situation. But that's where these people go. And it drives me nuts. And all I'm trying to do, as you are, we're trying to help people. And somehow I get yelled at. And I get death threats. I get, I get me. I'm a fucking trainer. I have a degree in exercise physiology and nutrition. I get death threats because I'm the worst human being on the planet. I don't know if you're there yet, but it's coming. You, you think you had PTSD? <laughs> Stop. Wait, wait until Peter finds out your name and uh, what happens. It, it's, it's a different world. Um, so you're a cop. You decide in 2019, I'm getting out. I'm going to take my pension. And uh, you're 80 pounds overweight at the time. Talk to me about your health. All right. So I started battling PTSD, you know, obviously after the incident being shot, you know, going back out there into the jungle and doing police work. I was always riding around at an eight or nine instead of maybe a five or something. And, you know, keep doing that over and over again. It takes a toll on your marriage and your kid and your life. So I, I was lucky, very fortunate to get a desk job, like an evidence job where I was in intake evidence involved in court cases and stuff like that. It was a very like 
low pace job it was good for me you know but in the meantime i was still gaining weight you know at the time of my incident i was about 220 and by the time i retired i was around 250 and okay. right, how, how right, tall how tall eric six foot okay six foot 250 definitely morbidly obese right and i was um the cholesterol talk started coming from the doctors as usual all my other uh, markers were good though and I always played basketball. I was a football player in high school, one year of college, walked on at Valdosta State over there in Georgia. And, you know, I saw the writing was on the wall. I wasn't going to Sunday, so I ended up going to Florida State. But that's when I started battling weight because I kept eating like I did when I was playing high school ball, trying to bulk up, right? So that's where the hard, high carbs came in. And, you know, I by the time, I guess about 2015, I was seeking therapy for PTSD, battling workers' comp. You know, where they made me break down in front of, uh, you know, a whole room full of lawyers to make sure I was, you know, sick. Right. Even though I had a gunshot through my foot. But so we go through all that, finally see a therapist working on my mind. Right. And at the same time, a buddy of mine just had mentioned keto to me. And I was like, keto, I didn't you know, I said this before. I didn't know what it was. It sounded painful. I thought it was some CrossFit training thing or something. So. Yeah. And then I looked into it and this guy lost 50 pounds and he's grabbing the rim on the basketball court. And I was like, man, he's getting up there. And, you know, I dabbled in it and it made sense. I started losing weight and I started understanding it. But at that time, that's when the doctors diagnosed me with heart disease. And then we had mentioned earlier, a CAC score is pretty high. They wanted to put stents in me. And I was really like on the fence of what I was going to do. And right. Dr. David Diamond's stent presentation, I mean, statin presentation to open my eyes. Dr. Ken Berry, all these guys, and you know, helped me get into this world. I found you, of course, all the documentaries and stuff like that really gave me a chance. I was like, oh, okay. It's not all black and white, just what they're saying. There is another side to this. And then I dove into the keto world and, you know, lost about 40 pounds. And then I went carnivore right when I retired, like pretty strict. And I lost another 25 and got down to 176 at six foot tall. Saw my abs for the first time. I think when I was a fat kid, I'm sorry, obese kid. I jumped from like sixth, seventh grade around there. And next thing you know, I went from maybe 150 because I played football. It was I was like 190. I don't ever remember being in the 170s, you know. So that was, and then you know, like I said, I'm feeling better. I'm more confident. You know, I'm mentally getting better because I'm feeding my brain healthy fats. You know, I'm not starving, mm -hmm. trying to keep my cholesterol low. And then it just opened my eyes. I started diving in this world. And I was helping cops because they before I left, when I lost 40 pounds. They're like, Reynolds, how, how'd you lose so much weight? And I'm like, dude, you got to get off the processed food, the seed oils. And then I started a little group chat, about five guys. They started losing weight and then it spread. And they kept calling me, you know, in the hood when they run away from you, 5 O's here, 5 O, you know, and yeah. they kept calling me 5 O in evidence and then became keto 5 O. And I was like, ah, let me start a little Facebook group. And we brought in some deputies from some other you know, agencies, just to help a couple of people talking and just started slowly growing. And, you know, here I am. And I started a company with it just to help promote and or help cops and say, hey, dude, there's another way to do it besides popping pills. I'm not big with pharma anyways. I was in narcotics units where we busted doctors, pill mill, all during the opiate crisis, you know, and all these elderly yeah. people that I used to have to roll their bodies over because they were dead because of maybe you know, just old age on medication. They didn't die a healthy old life. And you see all the pills. I was like, look at all these pills, man. This can't be natural. So I was already kind of skeptical, you can say. So when they started telling me about stents, I looked at the keto route and it saved my life, man. I mean, I don't know. It's been amazing. And I've helped a lot of other people and it's helping family members now. It takes a little bit, you know, they're all, not always on board right away, but well, you know, you said something in there that that really struck a chord with me. You said black and white. You know, doctors are so black and white. And a lot of times people write to me, what do you have against doctors? It's like nothing, nothing. The problem is, is that people will listen to the first doctor's opinion or they, you know, they won't look any deeper because a doctor said it. So it's got to be somehow the absolute truth. I'll give an example I'm living through right now. <clears throat> um, sometime right before, right, you know, everything is before the pandemic, after pandemic. It, it was right before the pandemic, before the gym shut down. One day I was working out and I was still warming up with uh, shoulder press with 15 pound dumbbells. You know, I, I always move very slowly and holding. And something just like a lightning bolt went down my neck, down one side of my neck. 
And I mean, I pulled the muscle. I walked out of the gym with my head crooked to the side. I didn't, I couldn't work out. I didn't finish the workout. And I was like, well, I pulled a muscle or something. Well, it just got worse and worse. During the pandemic, I was exercising and working out. I had to be very careful. My neck was just getting just so bad. And I wasn't going to go to a doctor at the beginning of the pandemic because they had us all scared as fuck. Mm -hmm. So I just, okay, I'm just going to have to deal with this. But after people started going back to the doctor, I went and then I started getting dizzy every now and again and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I was on a skeet field one day and almost fell over. I had to use my gun as a crutch on the ground because it's like, there's something going on with this and the whole thing. I go to um, a neurologist and, and they, they, they do all of their scans and x-rays and everything. I go to another specialist and, and they go, okay, here's the deal. Football really screwed you up. You know, your neck, you have two vertebrae in your neck that's absolutely bone on bone. And from what we can tell, a nerve is getting trapped in between those two vertebrae, and that's what's causing all of this pain. And I was like, all right, what's my options here? And here's the black and white. Well, you can do surgery. Okay, how does this work? What was it? Well, we go in, we can... We can put like a fake joint in there. We'll we'll crush out the old vertebrae. We'll put a fake joint. We can fuse it. That's you know, if we fuse it, that's the easiest way. And uh, or we could go in and put these new joints in, and you'll be like brand new. We go through the front of your neck and we go in and we carve it out and we do it. And I'm like, wait, you guys are right close to the spinal cord. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's like, mm, I don't know about this, right? Is there anything else we can do? Any exercise or anything we can do? Well, not a whole lot. And so now, black and white, the only way you're going to be out of pain is by doing the surgery where we go near your spinal cord, which, by the way, if we nick it, you'll never use your hands again, much less your feet, right? They don't tell you that part. I'm doing that math myself. They don't want to scare you too much. So then I went to another doctor. Is there anything? He goes, well, I can send you to a pain management guy. And I said, look, is this guy going to give me drugs? Because if it's drugs, then I'm out. I'm just not going to do it. And he goes, no, no, they have other stuff. I go to the, this guy, right? Yeah. First thing he says, drugs. We got to give you drugs. <clears throat> Opiates. So he goes, wait, you want me to live on these things? Or is this just like for a week or two? Oh, no, no, you're going to be on these things. Good stuff. And I'm like, well, but I, I can't live on opiates. I, you know, I can't even stand it if I get it for a surgery and I got to use it for a couple of days. I can't live on this. Well, that's all you can do. Again, <clears throat> black and white. This is all you can do. If you don't want to get the surgery, you can now take a drug. You'll be looped out all day long. Doesn't matter. You'll be hooked on this shit. Go do it. I, again, couldn't do it. One day when I was hiking, you know, I was getting ready for one of my climbs or whatever. And whenever I put a backpack on, the pain just became excruciating, right? I, I just couldn't take it anymore. Um, so then I tried things like CBD, right? Went out, got the best CBD in the whole thing. And I noticed when I took CBD, it didn't make me high. It was no, no reward or anything. But I noticed that if I took it for a few days in a row and upped my omega-3s, my fish oil, my krill, and all of that, just bringing those doses, you know, these are natural things. Mm -hmm. Pain dropped by like ah, 20, 30%, which is a lot when you're in striking pain. You know what that's like. Yeah. Right? But now I'm thinking, wait, these doctors are not so cut and dry. They, they were telling me there's nothing I can do, right, except surgery or take these drugs. And I took two natural things. I took krill oil and CBD, and here I am. I'm feeling a little better. And then I start going, I wonder what else I can do. I start throwing cayenne in a glass with water and drinking it. I'm doing all the, the shit, all the woo-woo shit. Yeah. Right? I've now brought my pain down to a manageable level to where I can now do neck exercises, very simple neck exercises, to start moving my neck, moving it around. Long story short, I do these neck exercises every other day. I don't do them every day. I do them every other day to give it a break. 
I have virtually no pain. Virtually no pain. I might wake up some mornings with a little something because I worked out a little too hard in the gym or went a little crazy on a, on a mountain bike ride or what have you. Right. Right. But virtually no pain. I was told three years ago, drugs, surgery, nothing else, black and white. Right. Every, every time. Every single time. Mm -hmm. uh, do I still take the CBD? Yes. Do I take it every day? No. I do take my my omegas, you know, my company. I, I take the one my company makes. Right. right. But I'm taking this high dosage of krill oil, this this omega-3 fatty acid every day. And every second, you know, sometimes every other day I'll take a little dropper right before I go to bed of CBD, you know, for inflammation. No pain. I'm not zonked out all day and I've not right. had a surgery. Why couldn't someone tell me that? Because doctors don't give a shit. They don't care about that. Here's what we have to, to offer. We can't make any money on CBD. We can't make any money on you buying a neck harness on Amazon for 15 bucks, you know, to start working your neck. That's, all, that's where I spent. Thing is hanging right, right here, right off. You, you can see it off the back of my uh, rack. You see it? Yeah. It there. That's my neck harness. It sits right there. I use it every other day. Without fail. If I go on a trip, I take it with me. And since I don't want to carry the weight in my suitcase, I, I hook I, I got rubber bands back there. I hook rubber bands to it and put it in a door jam and use it that way. Where there's a will, there's a way, Eric. And yep. it's, it's like you've done the same thing. You were doing one thing, you had PTSD, you had these lawyers fuck with you, right? Yeah. Then you get out. What's the next thing you do? You're working with these other cops. They're doing better. Take me from there. Well, then I, I, uh, I met Doug Reynolds from Low Carb USA, and I ended up doing. That was my first podcast. I'd actually done reference nutrition in my journey, so I felt really good at, about talking about it. So I was like, man, this is a cool little story. I got losing eighty pounds, you know, and the keto thing, and the PTSD. So I just started talking more, you know, trying to, you know, get more exposure, you know, and I went to nutrition school and I got my, you know, sports nutrition license and personal training license. And I started helping guys more individually. It's not like I'm going to your gym and I'm running a class, you know, right. it was, I want, if you're, if I'm, if I usually, I, you know what, I was given a gift. So most of the first responders I work with, I don't ever ask for anything. I'm going to help you heal yourself and then set you free so you can then help other people's kind of right. So right. I want to search your cabinets. I want to, you know, find, go shopping with you. You know, you're, I want to really teach you this because I didn't know it either until I started walking, watching, you know, like your documentary and then reading books like Nina Teichel's book and just organized crime everywhere. I look, they're nothing but, you know, they're controlling the industry. They're profiting from us being sick. And then it became more of a passion. Like we got to get these guys. And maybe that's where I got it from. Cause you know, who, raise me so there is definitely some right. type of drive looking into that stuff and i took it personal you know you poisoned me with all your propaganda you know the food industry even the medical industry because it's kind of yeah. like communism you get one one option right that's it this is what yeah. you get you know or you got to pay out of pocket to go see someone that really knows what they're talking about right so that's the way we went so you know i started helping cops and then, uh, you know, there was a place in New York that told me to take down my thin blue line flag and it caused some issues. And I gave the guy some of my two cents and recorded it and put it out there. And then that camping group I was part of, Thousand Trails, suspended me for two months. Whoa, whoa, go, go back to that. <laughs> so wait. This is all along the same path. It's insane, dude. They told me you can't fly this police flag in our campground. But they had Canadian flags and they had other flags. So I put right, up. A, so you to explain to the audience the thin blue line flag. What, all what, right. I mean, I know what it is, but go ahead. There's a lot of controversy out there. But from what my understanding, it goes way back in, when the uh, the Scots helped the British beat the Russians. And it was a smaller outmanned Scottish line. They call it the red line. Didn't break and they beat the Russians. So it kind of went through a little channel of bravery and blah, 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 the thin red line. And then eventually over time in the 1900s, it got kind of pushed into some different police departments, possibly as the thin blue line to build pride and make us different than the rest. And the blue line is pretty much the difference between, you know, you have chaos and you have order. Right. And the blue line is us in between and it moves. 
with whatever society is kind of dictating at that time. You know, the courts change laws. We got to go this way. You know, we're always an even flow. And, you know, that's what it's always meant. My mom's had officers killed in line of duty up in Washington, D.C. So my whole life, the thin blue line flag meant our brotherhood. And it's not white or black. Every police department I've ever been a part of or seen in my life, especially in South Florida, has been a mixed bunch of people, men, women from all cultures, all trying to do the right. same difficult job. So I really took it personal. PTSD kicked in. I gave the guy my two cents. And when I put it out there, people started canceling their memberships to this camping group. And then they suspended me for two months from the camping, which is like you can go book ahead of time and stay for you know two weeks and then move and move around. It's, it's a pretty cool little camping situation. So right. all these campgrounds in upstate New York, four different ones, invited me and my, my family and I and our flag and our rig, our RV trailer that we were traveling in. And said, come stay with us. And they covered the whole two months. Every place we went to, we met wow. cops, firemen, first, I mean, dispatchers, corrections, military. And it was just, we had campfires just telling war stories. It was almost like getting back into the brotherhood again. Right. right? And it was a safe zone. So I started thinking about this cops and campers idea of like, man, we should do more events like this. And that's what got me to go down the cops and campers route, starting a nonprofit to bring metabolic health to these guys because they need it. Almost every one of them is on medication, especially the retired guys. They're all diabetic or pre-diabetic. So there's they need it. And coming from me, going through my journey, they're more likely to listen to me, you know, because I've gone right. through, you know, and that's that end of things. It's been really beneficial. There's one coming up in Atlanta and New York this summer. Um it's something I'm really passionate about. So it should be cool. And, you know, hopefully one day if we make it uh, across, you know, up to Virginia to have one, we can have you come motivate the guys too, you know? So. I'd love to just hang out, you know? Yeah. And, 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 you know, I love meeting people and being out there. You know, I go to, usually whenever I'm invited, I show up it, it, as long as it's reasonable, right? Right. Um, I'll show up, absolutely. So, wow, well, it, it kills me that, you were flying a flag in a campground and they they wanted to kick you out or they kicked you out based on that. Well, it's not, it's not like you were flying, you know, a swastika flag or, you know, or anything like that. You were just flying the cop flag, right? That's all it was. I was camping. <laughs> uh, did, were you aware that it, it, it had become uh, a flag that people didn't like? Or right? this is the first I'm hearing of it. I just well, just, 20, well, you know, 2020 was the year of the riots, you know, and, right. you know, COVID was kicking butt at that point. And, you know, all of a sudden it became the media, you know, how, you know, bias or media is it became this blue lines, you know, white Trumpers. And then all of a sudden the other end, was you know whether it's blm or democrat whatever just became they threw us into this side even though half the so you guys below. weren't trying to get you guys weren't political <clears throat> you got thrown into a political war that's pretty much what happened because we're actually you know we're i guess authority at that point and we're working for the man that's the way they were looking at us not that we're all struggling the same guy that's throwing rocks at us i'm struggling just like you brother i'm still trying to tough you know pay my bills right. Right. You know, I got kids I'm trying to juggle and stuff. I'm in the same boat. You know, they got us fighting each other here, you know, time to look up, you know. So yeah. that's how I felt. And I'm glad I got out in 2019 and avoided all that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't, you know, I, I couldn't understand. And I was trying to understand it all. Like I said earlier in the show, I don't do politics, but I was trying to understand. It's like, well, you got some football players kneeling. I, and then my question became, what are they kneeling about or for, or they have something against the country or, you know, because it's doing the national anthem. What was that? And it was like, no, no, they're, they're kneeling during the national anthem because they hate cops. And I'm like, but that's the national anthem. They weren't playing some cop anthem. Right. Yeah, like I, I'm always asking the question. And when, if I ask too many questions, people, well, that sounds racist. It's like, oh, no, no, I'm just, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get heads or tails here. That's all. That's the problem. You're trying to ask questions and you're getting like, you know, the same thing like you talked about with climate change and eating, you know, eating animals. And it's just like, geez, it, you know, people are just aren't really that educated across the board. Then, you know, they find one way to go and they just ride it, man. You know, you have to unlearn stuff. I've unlearned a lot of things in law enforcement. I unlearned a lot of things, too. Yeah. 
not everything was black and white. You know, there's a gray area in law enforcement, whether you arrest, you don't arrest, whether you, you know, do things and how you handle situations. So I always felt like I was the scales, you know, always trying to just balance it, you know, and I feel like in society, no one's doing that. It's like, come on, some side does some bad stuff. This side does some bad stuff. I mean, you got to follow the money. You always got to follow the money. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that's what I always try to show in my movies. It's like, where's the, what's the agenda? Well, they don't really hate you. They're just trying to make money. Mm -hmm. You just need to understand that part of what they're doing, right? So, yeah, it's it's all just nutty. Um, so what's the camper? You know, are you living out of a camper? Do you have a home base? So, I, know you have, I know you have a wife, right, and a kid. And are you guys all huddled up in a camper? So my wife started indoctrinating me in the tiny house shows. We all watch those with our girls, right? You're sitting around tiny house. So it'd be really fun. You hit my head on half the stuff in the place, right? And she slowly started thinking, you know, we could sell this house down in South Florida and we could just travel the country in a trailer and then maybe look at some land in another place. And I've been trying to get out of South Florida since I got shot, right? So I was mm -hmm. like, let's look. You know, my mom had retired to Tennessee. So we started looking at the Carolinas and that whole area up, up there. And she mentioned the get, let's get a trailer. And I never towed a, a camper or really a tent camp. That's about all I've ever right, done. Right. So now she's talking about getting a big old truck, pulling our house around. And I thought this lady was from, you know, Venus. Right. So all of a sudden we get the trailer and I'm driving and I couldn't believe it. I'm towing our house. We're going up the turnpike in Florida, heading to Georgia. And then, you know, we backed in and learned how to do all, you know, little mistakes. I never crashed it. Knock on wood. Everything's been. Yeah, that's some blowouts, everything that you go through. Right. My, kid, my two boys were eight and four when we set out. Now they're 12 oh. and eight. So they've lived four years full time on the road, homeschooling. Um, we had pulled them out in 2018 just because of the way my oldest son's a regular, like active boy. It needs to run around. He doesn't right. pay attention because he's just full of energy. He's supposed to be a little warrior, a little hunter. Let's get out there, run around like a dog, right? You take him to the park, dog comes back, he's chill. Now he can read and do all those things. So we were able to find what was conducive for him to learn. And traveling, letting him touch bugs, go hunting in the woods, climbing trees, building fires, learning. You know, he's got his little uh, bug out bag full of all his stuff. I mean, that kid could survive out in the wild right now at 12, build himself a little. You know, we watch alone, you know, and we talk about stuff. Really interesting show. All right. So wait, let, let's go back a little bit. All right. So, all right, so <laughs> the house is gone. Right. So you, you, you threw napalm at a bridge. You, you can't go back. There's nowhere to go back to. You, you, you sold the house. We sold the house. We do have a house. We have family that we could, you know, hey, we can stay in your upstairs room or another ex spare bedroom, but we don't have a house to pull into and just empty our stuff. So, yeah, yeah. You can't go. Lied. You can't go. Hey, we're back from the trip. Here's a house. Right. You're pulling your house. So uh, I got to know what kind of truck did you get? What kind of what? Truck. What kind of truck did you buy? Uh, well, workers comp was nice to give me a little bit of a settlement, a little wee bit of a settlement. So I did buy an F-350 dually truck because I wanted something big to pull in case I'd got a fifth wheel. I have a bumper pull right now. Right. I wanted to upgrade. I wanted the big. Plus, I wanted the storage in the back because I knew we didn't have a house. So I used the back with a camper. And that's the, that's probably the van you see all the time. It's just this big black truck with Keto 5.0 on it. It's got right. all my supplies in it so what kind of camper do you have behind we have that? something called it's called an atc it's aluminum toy comp i'm sorry aluminum trailer company it's all aluminum it's a toy hauler where the back comes out we can make it into a patio deck we can roll down the side so it extends the 28 foot trailer into like 36 feet which people are like losing their mind but when your backdrop is the beach the woods you're right. outside you know we have gazelles and tents and stuff you just you know it's just an extended version and you're in nature, vitamin D, you're hearing the birds chirp, you're seeing deer. It's just what a way for a guy to go out that had such a stressful job to now be laying there looking at pine cones and just, I don't know. It's just, it's such a healing. I think it really is healing me along this journey that I've been on, you know? Yeah. You know, I'm thinking about all the logistics. Usually when people get into campers, they start off as weekend warriors where they have a camper it's a certain size, you know, just to go. Usually as guys that like dirt bikes or <clears throat> going to the lake and, and boating and the whole thing, they'll have a camper. You mentioned the toy hauler situation. And then they'll go, okay, I know what this camper is. Now I can go upgrade to the next camper. You go from zero 
to, hey, I'm going right into this. I mean, I have to, you have to feel like you made a few mistakes. Oh, I wish I had gotten this, or we really didn't need that. Or was there any of that going on? Well, we financially, you know, when I we hit the road, oh, you're sneezing. You all right? All right. Um, we uh, only had my pension. My wife decided to not, you know, she gave up her career when we had our first son. Um, she breastfed for three years. She wanted to be involved in my son's life. And and the long, more she was with him, the harder it became for her to let him go. So right. doing this trailer life was financially better for us because now we don't have the big mortgage down in, you know, Palm Beach County. But, you know, different parks have different rates. There's different deals along the way. Like if you stay six days, they'll give you an extra day. If you stay a month, that's cheaper than you pay in per week. So you learn a lot of those specific things, where to go, where they're kid friendly, where they're flag friendly. You know, obviously I found that out. And then yeah. just some of the other specifics, like we like the state parks. You usually get a big spot. There's a lot of open room. You know, some of those resorts are cucky, you know, like those neighborhoods, the suburban neighborhoods are all do, 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 do. There's no room to move around. Right. Those are, and those are high end. Some are really nice, but we don't like being boxed in, you know, plus with me being a cop, I like to see what's coming. And, you know, it's this whole thing. And, but the people we've met, the people that we have met from different places, like I've heard you say before, just meeting different people and, you know, the experiences that they bring, it's so fascinating because you get stuck in your same environment, you know, and when you get out there, you meet people that worked in Antarctica or that have been to Spain or, you know, different places around the world that maybe you haven't been to. And it's just, right. you sit around and you build a bond and then we meet other homeschool parents and our kids become friends and, you know, you kind of keep track of each other. Where are you guys going to be in the winter? And then you make plans. Hey, maybe we'll pass through. It's really a cool like scene, man. You know, I don't know if they're going to let us do it in the future with all the regulations, especially with diesel and all this stuff. They're trying to yeah, uh, take some of our, you know, freedoms away, but this is a great life, especially if you just need a break or you're divorced, you want to downsize, you can't afford the apartment, get yourself a trailer, man. Go park at a state park for a couple of months. You'll see what a blessing it is. Oh, listen, my, my good friend that I go hiking with all the time, uh, this guy, Don Coddington, hang on. Don Connington's Friday, five o'clock. Connington's always saying, Hey, we need to get a, uh, we need to get ourselves a, you know, like one of those uh, camper vans, like one of those Mercedes things and yeah. soup up and the whole thing and, and just travel around. And, you know, it, it sounds romantic. You know, we like hiking and going places and doing all that and being, in, you know, but we're both still working. Right? right. Like there's no pension where I'm concerned. They have stopped working. It's the day it all ends. But right. But I can see that in the next 10 years, getting something like that, that's all contained where I can be on the road for two or three weeks at a time because I've been around this entire country and I know where I like to be. I know where I want to be in Montana. I know where I like to be in Wyoming. I know where I like to be in Colorado and you name it, Utah. There's so many beautiful areas where you can just go and, and just be there for a while. And I don't think I need to have, you know, all, all of the accoutrement, you know, being in a four-star hotel or this resort, or that resort, I'd rather be right there, right? I'd rather be in a tent. Right. You know, it's often been said that I'm probably more comfortable in a tent than a bed. Uh, so I, I get that version of it, and I romanticize about it. That's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on today. But while you're on the road, you're doing, you're, you're proselytizing to some degree uh, keto, right, and good health. So explain right. what you're doing there. Well, you know, I did the sports nutrition, you know, I started the company where I, you know, I'm pretty much just, let's say a health coach. I mean, on paper, I'm going to come help you get healthy and, you know, we're going to have a relationship and with that comes the, you know, I mentioned the cops and campers stuff. So they've kind of like this two headed monster that overlaps at times. And, you know, I have access to a big law enforcement community. Um, and I really want to push this end of it in there because it's, it's really important, you know, and, it's been, you know, learning how to, you know, going from that world of police work into the private sector, you know, it's been challenging and trying to figure, navigate social media being, you know, let's face it, they're looking at me as ultra conservative because I'm a cop, you know, so they're gonna mm -hmm. kind of, I'm already right now, I can't make a post for like three days or something, you know, it's just stuff happens that, you know, I, I think I was over posting about my mom's situation, you know, with Griselda. So it's just like, all right, so I can't do anything right Wait, now. Wait, who's stopping you from posting? Well, I got blocked on Facebook right now for a while. I don't know. 
And based on what? Because I have a friend who literally posts shit about wanting certain people dead, and they never do anything about him on Facebook. My mom got blocked too. She's blocked till March. She's just a lady that, you know, she's 74. She promotes her typical stuff that a 74. But hang, hang on, hang on. All right. <laughs> because you see, I quit posting on, um, on uh, Instagram, which is a Facebook product. I quit posting there two weeks ago. By the time this comes out, it'll be three weeks. And people said, why did you quit posting? I was like, well, you know, my stuff kept going up and up and up. You know, I was at 100,000 people. Now I'm at 93,000. They just keep taking people away from me. And people keep writing to me, why did you cancel me? Why did you get rid of me? And you're like, I didn't do anything. Right. I, I don't even know how to make someone go away. So they're, you know, they're shadow banning me and pulling my people away as more people are coming in, right? Because we can see that several hundred people a day come in, but they take that number of people away plus 0.3% more every day. It's just a downward spiral. But they've actually put you in jail, right? I don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, obviously... My my mom's got very conservative opinions on stuff, but it's nothing that she hasn't been doing before the show came out. So I think because we got a little bit of um, push and we're having a lot more response, you know, cause she's active on some different websites right. or something that's talking police stuff. And I don't know, it's just strange. We both get kind of shadow banned a little bit and, you know, all I've ever done is talk health, you know, same thing, you know, I'm not selling anything. It's not like I'm selling any poison or anything, you know, they are. You know, but here we are trying to tell them to get off the point. But if you know, if you do any kind of pornography, you're fine. You can you can put whatever you want up. You you can be half naked on any of those sites, no problem, right? Yeah. You can be a hot if you're a hot chick on Instagram, your numbers just go up and up and up. I'm not stupid. I get why. Right. right? But if you're talking, if if you're me, I don't talk anything political. No one knows if I'm on a right, left, center. Do you know if I'm right or left? Do you have any idea? Nope. No, no one does. People have ideas. Some people are, well, you know, he shoots shotguns. That means he's a right winger. <laughs> and some people go, yeah, but his best friend is gay. Obviously, he's on the left. No one knows where I am. But because well, why, why do you got to be categorized? You know? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I, I'm not, I, I don't see how they could put me in a category, but, but they do. And they go, well, he tells people to eat meat, therefore that's politically wrong. I don't know how eating meat is politically wrong, but I'm like the tip of the spear of, of, and you're going to get there if you're not there already, but I'm still trying to figure out what, what did you say for them to put you in Facebook jail? Did you say? I don't something? know. They don't even tell you. The last post I made was, I think it was taco Tuesday, but I had a, I made a meme of a taco with a big piece of brisket in it. So it was a little taco with a brisket with a face on it. But it wasn't like anything crazy. So I'm like, maybe they're catching up on some other post I made. But I've in the last year or so, two years, I've really behaved. Like I started feeling the game out. You know, you can't talk vax. You can't talk, you know, you got to Bill Gates or whatever. You got to say Gil Bates or whatever. You know, you got to do all the little tricks, you know. And I just started right. speaking, hey, get off seed oils, podcast that I like, a book I like. Maybe it's about PTSD. You know, all this stuff is just sharing information. And I don't know. I I know I can do the same post on TikTok as Keto 5.0. I'll do the same one with cops and campers. And my smaller cops and campers will get more views than my bigger audience on the TikTok side. And I've been right. banned from them before because of stuff I put up that I thought was okay, like a cop chase. All of a sudden they're like, that's violence, you know, and or someone was bullying. And it was just like, man, they're just hammering me right off the bat. So, hey, it doesn't matter. I'm getting enough of the word out there. I got a great network of these cops that are going to help me with cops and campers in Tolona Ridge in Georgia and LAJ, Georgia in April. You can come to that one or Ithaca, New York is the other one at Spruce Row. And we're going to have, I think Dr. Kiltz is going to come to the one in Spruce Row, kind of talk to the guys. I want to do a meetup. I want to roast a pig at a pig event or a cop event. I think that'd be nice. hilarious. Roast yeah. a pig, talk shop, you know, have some, you know, glucose testing and stuff like that. So guys can kind of monitor and be, maybe a few of them would be like, you know what? I think these guys are on the sum and that's how the movement starts in that world. Right. So, well, look, that's all we're trying to do here. You know, whenever I talk to my friend, Nina tie shows, we're, we're always sitting around going, we've been doing this for 12 years now on the internet. Have we made a difference? 
we're always wondering, have we made any difference at all? And the answer is yes, because we've spawned people like you. Absolutely. Right? And a ton of other people who are out there talking. And look, I mean, you know, you know, even YouTube has started shadow banning me. So I went over to something called um, Rumble. Right. And people say, oh, that's a right wing thing. It's like, I don't know if it's right wing or left wing. They don't have a sign that says, hey, we're right wing. Right. I didn't see a... Um, it starts with R, though. Yeah, it starts with R. And I, <laughs> I, when I got there, I didn't see a Confederate flag as their symbol or anything like that. I, I don't know why they're right wing. All I know is that they are promising not to shadow ban me so I can get my message out there. So why am I the bad guy? Right. Well, we know why. You're, you're, you're affecting the bottom line. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, you know, Bill Gates or Bill Hates doesn't want me or whatever we're calling him these days. Yeah. Um, in the interest of not keeping you all day, um, the show Grisilda comes out. Uh, I'll probably never watch it because I, I hate whenever I, I hear anything about the, the Medellin cartel or any of that. I, I'm not watching it. I, I just hate it, right? I can't stand anything to do with drugs. I've never done a drug. I still, at this age, I've never smoked pot. I'm 61 years old. You would think I would have grown up on pot. Oh, so having the Rasta 5.0 CBD company with your company, it's not going to work? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, people keep asking me, why don't you get into CBD? And it's like, I'm, I don't know. I might, but the bottom line is, I'll never sell THC or anything like that because I've never done a drug in my life. And I, I hate everything, you know, when, when people talk about, what's his name, the, the, the guy from Bogota, that he's dead now. What's his name? Um, Pablo Escobar. Yeah, Escobar. Goes, oh, you know, he had hippos and now hippo. And it's like, I don't want to know anything about a fucking crooked, drugged out piece of shit. Right. You know, that, that some people think is a goddamn hero. I'm sorry. I'm right. sorry. He's done nothing... We have dead people in this country based on him, right? Because of him, you know, and if you don't think, you know, now we're looking at all of this, uh, you know, these new drugs coming in, they're lacing everything with that new drug. Fentanyl and, 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 all, and all this kind of stuff. If you don't think that's, that didn't start with him and that didn't come through all of that, think again. And we're, oh, it's China. Yeah, but wh wh where do you think that's coming through, right? Well, how do you think that's getting here, right? These cartels still exist. So how does your mom, tell me about Griselda. I know who she was. She was a piece of shit criminal down in Miami. How does your mom come into this whole thing? So I guess my mom is, this is another thing how I get labeled. Um, she's a Cuban, you know, she was born in Miami. My grandmother was from Havana, Cuba and fled Castro. So my mom, my grandmother married a country boy from Hickory, uh, well, actually, he passed away over there in Hickory, but he was from North Carolina. So my mom grew up pretty much half Cuban and half country girl. Right. And wow. she was fluent in Spanish, went actually to Florida State on an art scholarship back in 1968. Wow. And I guess she was going to be a hippie at that, you know, 1968 painting. Come on. Yeah. Right. So she ended up my dad was in the Air Force. They got together, knocked her up. She became military wife four years later, you know. They get divorced and she's in Miami. So by 1975, she ended up becoming a police officer in Miami-Dade Police Department. Back in that day, it was Metro Dade. And her, she was very valuable during those investigations because she spoke Spanish. So when they started having Colombians killing each other for drugs, they was like, well, we need, how do we talk to these witnesses? Oh, June, you know, June Hawkins, she knows how to, she could talk to these guys. She squared away, right? So by 1979, um, Griselda Blanco, who had become the queen pin of dealing drugs in Miami by whacking the competition, typical mobster type move. And right. she was pretty violent. She'd chop them up, put them in suitcases, leave them at your front door. Hello, you know, stuff like that. So it was just everywhere. So they started a task force. They went to Congress. And then this is when Reagan was in office. You know, he was just coming in in 1980 and Bush was vice president. So they ended up starting a CENTAC task force, mixed up a whole bunch of different police officers, FBI agents, DEA, or, you know, whoever what they could put in this unit. Well, they grabbed my mom because she was already kind of involved in doing these investigations. And back in those days, they the woman had her role. She did the memos. 
she did some of the wire listening and record, you know, all that BS work that the men didn't want to do. You right. Know? There's some references in the show how they turned on the AC to make stuff happen to her body, you know, that happens in the cold, you know, so there's some stuff where my mom stands up for herself, you know, in life and that's in the show too. So anyway, she did this great career. Uh, she went through homicide. They end up eventually catching Griselda. She goes to prison, does 20 years, gets out goes back to Columbia. She gets killed in front of a butcher shop. She gets gunned down pretty much the same way she used to kill people. So almost like just desserts, right? Right. Time goes by, you know, she's in it. Her and my stepfather were actually both involved in those investigations at the time, but my stepfather and her weren't together. So they worked together, but weren't together. And then they got together later. So now, you know, there's a lot of information here in these two talks. And then the uh, Netflix people got in touch with me because they heard a podcast I got my mom to do talking about her son being involved in a shooting from her perspective as a law enforcement officer and being a female, you know, and it was fascinating. You know, a lot of people were like, wow, you know, she should have more podcasts. You know, she was just fun to talk to. Right. And then uh, next thing you know, a couple of books had, you know, there's a documentary called Cocaine Cowboys, same thing. And she's in that. So they end up calling me saying, we want to talk to your mom. I was like, oh, I thought they wanted to talk to me. Darn it. <laughs> I'm like, can I be an extra or something? So they end up flying out there, talking to my mom and stepfather, getting all their stories of all the players, who was doing what. And then they got signed on as advisors to the show. And then next thing you know, they're talking with the actors, going over scripts and stuff of how things were done. And really involved is really a great way. Because, I, you know, I didn't, we don't come from that scene. And I got to talk to the actors playing my mother, Juliana Martinez. You know, she's 30 years old, you know, from you know Miami. <laughs> she's like, it could be my daughter, but it's weird. You're playing my mom. How crazy is that? And, you know, it was just really kind of cool that they're going to tell my mom's story along with this, you know, queen pin, right? Yeah. And we've seen the show and it's really, they, they make my mom like the Griselda equivalent, like, my mom's doing everything, you know, and it was more yeah. of a team effort. We all know. And they, the guys know it that, you know, went through that with her, but my mom was really in part of figuring out codes and what, you know, stash houses. And there was a lot of work she put in and you're seeing it on the show. And she's become kind of like a little cult hero favorite amongst crime scene analysts, you know, female cops, any females in general. I mean, she was my hero. That's why I got her law enforcement, you know, but seeing going back to when I was five, to 10 years old to 12 years old what my mom was going through i never realized it till you start seeing the show even though it is dramatic they hype it up you know and they do have a little me in the show i i pop up in season two they got a little kid playing me and Vinny, i gotta say I, I knew he was he might be a little soft but the kid needs to probably go on a ketogenic or a carnivore diet he needs to build his jaw muscles up come on let's choose yeah. some it's a meat, it's right? a meat, yeah. So, anyways, the kids probably you know, doesn't have any control of that. But, anyways, it's it was cool to see the dialogue between the actress and the mom. And it's like one of the lines was, "Mom, don't forget about your gun in the glove box." Well, in 1979, my mom had a always had a gun in her glove box, plus the gun on her hip. It was just the thing she did, you know. And I knew shit broke bad, even as a nine or ten year old. We had a gun in it, you know. But I didn't go grab and take it to school. You know, I'm not getting that controversy, but, you know, you grow up around stuff, you go to shoot it, you understand and respect the gun and all that. So, but that's just one of the funny lines, because I used to remind my mom, don't forget about your gun, mom, you know, and there it is on the TV show. So anyways, it, it's really positive for her. And hopefully, you know, I know Vanity Fair interviewed her, People Magazine. I mean, how crazy is that? My mom, People Magazine. Wow. So I don't know if it's her, the whole show, and they're just interviewing different people, but it's surreal. And it's it's cool. She's 74. She's in Tennessee. You know, right now she's probably watching uh, Tucker or Fox and Friends or whatever, you know, show. <laughs> yeah. that. she likes Fox and business now. So it's just, you know, she's probably doing her gardening and just like a regular retired person. But yet she's got this fascinating history. And I'm thinking about writing a book. Kind of combining both of our stories and, you know, it might be called uh, The Heartbeat of a Lion. And you mentioned the beat as the yeah. walking. So, you know, there's been some stuff in there and there's some great stories with her. She should almost get her own like spinoff. Like June Hawk is hostage negotiator. She did that 15 years. I mean, she, it's tough being the third best cop in my family. Let's put it that way. Well, you know, it, it wouldn't be 
it wouldn't be weird. Like a lot of times they'll do these, um, these podcasts where they, they're trying to catch a murderer or, you know, someone, you know, a serial killer and they'll do like a series of six or eight. Yeah. I'm shocked no one has thought of doing like a series, these crime podcasts. They should be hitting your mom up to do uh, a series of five or six or seven shows. Maybe I should do it with her. You, you know, should. I don't even know, but maybe I should look, start looking into that because I could probably spark some interest with her from my background and being in Miami. You know, I don't know. She's fascinating, man. It's it's. She was telling me one time they were in a shootout once. And she was actually doing the radio calls in between them firing because they didn't want dispatch to know they were firing. You know, that kind of crazy old school stuff, man. Just Yeah, you know, she's <laughs> got stories that, you know, any, and because she was part of that whole Grisilda thing, I, and maybe someone's going to hear this because a lot of people hear this podcast and they'll go, oh, that's a great idea. We should go get, you know, um, your mom is not Mrs. Reynolds. You guys have different last names, right? Yeah, she's June Hawkins, but she she yeah. does have a married name, but she bounces around with the different. She, you understand? I have eight marriages between my two parents. That's a whole nother podcast show. Yeah, so. right. So, <laughs> so they could get your mom and you know do a, a multi part series podcast on her. You know they they're, they're they're not like this show. They're really polished. You know they do these things. I've listened to a couple of them. You know when they're trying to catch a criminal or do a certain thing. I don't see why they're not doing one of those on your mom. That that would she, be a great. She did one on the pillowcase rapist in the eighties. Oh, wow. yeah, it, it was pretty crazy times, you know, and especially for us. And, you know, <clears throat> she's probably got a ton of those stories. I mean, she tells me stuff that just comes out sometimes. Like you never told me that mom. Kind of like what I do to my kids now, you know, when they ask me stuff, let's hear a cop story, dad. I'm <laughs> like, well, do you want to go violent one, funny one, you know? So it's, she's got a whole bunch of those. Yeah, you know, whenever I sit around and talk to cops, man, I'll say, and you could tell me if this is right, I'll say, what's the scariest thing you guys do? And they'll go, domestic violence. You know, just domestic violence is the worst. You know? Yeah, it's a Pandora's box. And you're you're ending, enter, most of the time you're entering another man's house. And right. emotions are already hot. And right. they could have suffered, you know, the older I get, and I, you know, I've suffered my own trauma with police work and stuff. So I've looked at trauma a lot more, and you really do see why individuals are ending up at that point sometimes you know it could be their yeah. own life choices but at that point that's what makes it so dangerous because they may be desperate i mean i broke up a fight at the library in west palm between two guys because one guy looked at a grown-ass men because one guy looked at his girl and they started getting into it i'm like come on hey let's get back to reality yeah. folks you know and but yeah it's it's pretty wild yeah, I remember one time, and you, you always, and people say, why don't you, I don't leave the house very often unless I'm going out into the woods, and I was somewhere in, in California, and you know, sometimes you stop, and you're trying to think of something, and you're just staring off into space, and I'm staring off into space, and I'm, I'm you know, intently trying to figure something out, and all of a sudden, my concentration is broken by some guy going, hey, bro, hey, dude, what are you doing? And I'm like, what? What? Oh, he's talking to me. What, sir? Can I, can I help you? What are you doing? Looking at my woman, staring at my woman. I'm like, I, 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 and when I now I'm seeing the woman, and what I wanted to say was, hey, if I was going to stare that intently at a woman, it would not be that woman. Sorry, but but I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I was just sitting here trying to remember something, and I was in my own. But he wouldn't let up. He was in my face, right? Wow. I remember walking away going, wow, if, you know, I got it to deescalate. I was like, Hey, everything is cool. Everything is cool. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm, and I backed off because you get into a fight. Next thing you know, you clock someone, his head hits the curb. You something, he brain dead or you kill him. Right. Then you're a murderer, right? Second degree murder. And I'm like sitting there going, because I never want to do anything if I don't have to. Right. Right. And I was like, wow. And I remember getting in my car my truck at the time, I got in my truck and I went, wow, I was just standing there and I almost got into trouble. Like I, I could have ended up in jail by right. just fucking standing there. That, that's how, that's how, you know, just weird everything is. Right. And people are, Oh, you never go anywhere. It's like, no, I, I'll just, I'll just stay home. I'm good. I'm yeah, good. it's weird. I can go to different places camping. That's okay. It's exciting. After about two weeks, we get the 
itch to like, all right, it's time to move, go check something new out. You know, I think yeah. deep down we are kind of migrators. We're supposed to follow the herds and just keep moving. It's, yeah, you know, with my ancestry being the Spanish side, and then I got the English, Irish, Viking side of things. It's like we traveled, you know, our people. And yeah, I don't know if you know this, but in 2019, at the same time when they contacted me about Griselda and my mom and all that, I got notified by that DNA company 23andMe, and they said, "Hey, uh, there's a guy that's in Florida. He's your brother, and he's a cop." So I found a hot half brother cop in Orlando. Really? 2019 that we were actually on Fox and Friends. They interviewed us because 2019 they love cops. So it was a good story. <laughs> and we ended up on Lester whole NBC nightly news as a little wow. clip at the end, just because it was like two brothers, 50 years old, never knew each other. And it turns out my before my dad knocked my mom up, I'm sorry, before they, you know, made me. He uh <laughs> had some relations with a girl. I think he was working at Zares or Woolworths, and it was typical. She was in lingerie department. He was in the paint department. And he had said they had a little <laughs> fling, but he didn't think much of it. And here I got a brother, Dave, that's been RVing for 10 years. And I met him. I never camped. Wow. Him. He goes, let's go camping. I'll show you how to do it. My guardian angel showed up, man. It was just, it's just nuts, this ride, man. Unbelievable, man. So you know, what, you know where he grew up? San Diego. He was adopted by a military. Really? He was adopted by a military family. And his dad was the officer in charge of the Navy base out there where I mean, yeah where top gun was filmed so wow. dave got pictures hanging out with like goose and you know he was on the near the set because his dad was the top dog and i'm like yeah i'm struggling in miami my mom's fighting cartels and you're out there surfing in san diego you know you're with goose goose and mav right <laughs> just i'm like out. ducking bullet rounds you know it's so funny <laughs> but it's just been great man he's you know like he's going to be at that event in LJ. i'm trying to get my mom and them you know to be part of the meet and greet i figured how cool would you know for these other people to meet you know these you know these other people that are just like them we all suffer the same issues yeah we all battle metabolic disease we all need some you know we just need companionship and friends to hang out with stuff to do. You know, you might find a guy that likes to fish, another guy likes tennis, another guy likes pickleball. And now you got a little group. Now you're not sitting at home depressed all the time, you know? So, oh, absolutely. Uh, folks, if you want to find Eric Reynolds, go check out Keto 5 uh, And you want to go check out Cops and Campers. Is there a website for Cops and Campers? I don't see it here. Yeah, uh, copsandcampers.com. You can also find it on keto 5 com And... I got to give you one of my challenge coins. I give these out to my special heroes that helped save my life. It's uh, you're one of the top guys because when I was watching Fat, you know, it was in that path of watching Fat Fiction, Magic Pill, you yeah. know, really understanding it. And like I said, you spread it to me, and now I spread it out to everybody. I'll send you a coin and a T-shirt. And I, what are you, a medium now or a large? I mean, how uh, I weigh, I'm about your size. I'm six feet. I weigh about 170, 172 on a, on a strong day. Um, okay. pretty lean. um so whatever size you think I am, or you got you. send me that shirt, I'll wear it with pride. And, uh, I'll keep that coin right here on my desk. All so, right, brother. Um, yeah. I'll give you my address off the air. Okay. Uh, folks go check out everything Eric Reynolds is doing. This guy is getting the word out there. So I wanted to have him on this show. Uh, you know what to do with me. We all go shopping on Amazon. Before you go to Amazon, please go to VinnyTotteries.com. Click through the banner. It puts coal on the fire, and that's how we keep this show free for a gazillion years in a row. Rate and review this podcast. That's how more people find it. Rate and review. It doesn't cost you anything. Just go go wherever you, wherever you listen to this podcast. Rate it and review it. Now, if you're one of those jerks that listen to it in order to call me and tell me how much you hate me, I would appreciate it if you guys do not rate and review this podcast because you bring the numbers down. So you guys don't do anything. Everyone else, you know, go rate and review. On behalf of Eric Reynolds, my name is Vinny Tortorich. Put life into living and do it with enthusiasm.